Exposition on the Buddha, October 13th, 1979. Buddhism was founded by the Lord Buddha, a mentor in spiritual and philosophical topics who was renowned for his profound wisdom and insight. As a prince, he ruled his father's kingdom for 13 years before relinquishing his power to pursue his spiritual goal. For six grueling years he meditated before attaining enlightenment. If his wisdom hadn't been up to the standard of a sabbanyu, one who is all-knowing, he wouldn't have been enlightened and a great spiritual and philosophical teacher. So, while we are still living together, you have to really exert yourself, putting all your efforts into it and get something out of it. Don't let our living together be in vain. There's nothing in this world that can be a greater memorial than the enlightening tamma. All you have to do is to get the tamma into your jitta, to completely extinguish the fires of the gelesas, dharna, and asava, which drive the jitta recklessly and uncontrollably. You'll then have completely rid yourself of all burdens and accomplished your most grueling endeavor, which the Lord Buddha proclaimed as Vositang Brahmadariang, and your chitta will have realized absolute freedom. You'll no longer have to seek happiness, be bothered with the past, the future, birth, death, or rebirth, because you'll be absolutely contented. The Gelezes are very cunning. In the three realms of existence, nothing can be as clever as the Gelezes, rulers of these three realms. How did the Lord Buddha manage to vanquish all the Gelezes from his jitta? It was through his ability to apply common sense and insight. How else could he have neutralized the Gelezes and become the world's greatest mentor? How could an ignorant person do it? The intrinsic quality of a Buddha is profound and immeasurable wisdom that is boundless like the sky. The teaching of every Buddha is always complete and perfect in every respect mental or physical, or sila samadhi or banya, and could be easily understood by the monks and the laity. Although the Lord Buddha's teaching, which was successively transmitted down to us, might not be as complete and perfect as when the Lord Buddha taught it, it can still serve as an excellent guide. He taught his followers to be rational, especially those who practice mental development, such as the Gamartana monks. That's why I have always emphasized the development of sati and banya, as well as being thorough, observant, judicious, contemplative, and rational to keep you from practicing incorrectly. This is the way to develop wisdom as taught by the Lord Buddha. Although you won't be as wise as the Lord Buddha, at least you'll be his wise, faithful student. I love to listen to the results attained from practice of my students. Some have been here for quite some time. I have consistently taught them, and have never neglected this responsibility. I consider teaching the monks and novices more important than teaching the laity, because the monks are better prepared for the practice than the laity, since they aren't encumbered by the laity's livelihood. The monks' principal task is walking or sitting meditation. It's something they have to do themselves. There are plenty of lay Buddhist devotees who admire monks who practice faithfully, and are always ready to support them and provide them with the four requisites of living. You're well aware of this fact. So, what are you lacking other than exerting yourself in the practice for the Magga and Pala? You're not lacking in the four requisites of living. What you lack is exertion and the results from your practice beginning with calm and culminating in enlightenment. So, how are you going to resolve this issue other than putting in your effort? If you don't, you'll never achieve any result. No other vocation is more suited for enlightenment than a monk's vocation. But how can you expect to become enlightened when you merely toy with your practice and your chores? Whatever you do, you must never forget the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha. You must always keep them close to your heart, recalling how the Lord Buddha and his disciples practiced and achieved their goals, to keep you from falling into evil ways and to be boosted with diligence and energy. The Lord Buddha and his enlightened disciples demonstrated how hard and earnest they practiced. Were they ever involved with mundane matters? Their worldly experiences were similar to yours, but when they turned their hearts towards enlightenment, they were really earnest and resolute to the end. They were totally committed to their practice. Their corresponding results were also total. Means and ends are inseparable. The reason why you haven't come across any results is because you haven't applied yourself. You only have yourself to blame. I'm teaching you with the utmost of my ability and have never hidden anything from you. When it's time to reveal my practices and accomplishments, I do it fully. 
I make clear every aspect of Tamma that I know, not holding anything back from you. Why can't you apply them in your quest for enlightenment? One who has gone forth is a fighter who doesn't flinch or retreat. Where are the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana? I have told you many times before not to speculate about the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana being in this place or that place, at this time or that time, in the sky or on the ground, because they are all Sammati or conventional reality. Everything that surrounds you, the five Kantas and the entire world, is Sammati. The Magga, Pala, and Nibbana are not in these places, but are in the Four Noble Truths. The First Noble Truth is Dukkha, that of the body and the Jitta. The Lord Buddha called Dukkha a noble truth because it's absolute. The second noble truth is Samudaya, the origin of Dukkha, which are the Kilesas and created by the Jitta. This origin of Dukkha is comprised of three kinds of cravings. Craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, and craving for not becoming. Craving for sensuality means not being satisfied with visual objects, sounds, aromas, flavors, and tactile sensations that you experience from birth. This is the most troublesome Gilesa. The more you glut yourself with food and sleep, the more you'll increase and strengthen your sex drive. You have to identify Dukkha. Where is Dukkha now? It's in your body in Jitta. What generates Samudaya? It's Sankara, thought formations, and Sanya, acts of memory or recognition, as well as the objects of the five physical senses and the feelings and emotions in the Jitta that are created by your attachment to past experiences that consume you with burning desires. This is the way of amassing the Gelesas and Dukkha. This is the work of Samudaya that the Lord Buddha exhorted you to relinquish. He said you have to identify Dukkha and abandon Samudaya. How do you let go of Samudaya if not by the Magga, the path of practice leading to the elimination of Dukkha? What comprises the Magga? It's principally comprised of Sati and Banya, the most vital components that will enable you to completely let go of Samudaya. Regarding your craving for sensuality, you have to identify the objects of your desires. Why are you obsessed with this man or that woman? Are they really men or women? Are they worth cherishing? Banya has to analyze and reveal their true nature before you can let go of your attachment. Regarding Dukkha, you have to identify it. For example, Dukkha Vedana or painful feeling which arises from sitting for a long time or from illness. There is a cause for this Dukkha to appear. You have to look for the cause of this Dukkha. Where does it come from? Who says it's Dukkha and bears this Dukkha? Who rounds up the dukkha of the body into the jitta to afflict the jitta with two layers of dukkha? Who can this culprit be if not sanya, memory or recognition, the master of samudaya? The Lord Buddha said you must study the nature of sanya to see that it's just a mental phenomenon. The body is a physical phenomenon. Vedana, feelings, good, bad or neutral. Sanya, acts of memory or recognition. Sankara, thought formations. And Vinyarna, sense awareness. All are mental phenomena. Vinyarna will appear when the sense objects come into contact with the sense organs. When there is no contact, Vinyarna will disappear. These four mental phenomena originate from the jitta, while the body is the jitta's avatar. The jitta is tenaciously attached to the body by the powerful samudaya and delusion that mistakenly view the combination of the four elements of earth, water, air, and fire as one and inseparable. If you don't apply sati and banya to reveal their true nature, you won't be able to separate the body from the jitta. It's similar with physical pain. When you say physical pain is hurting you, you'll also create mental pain because you're not using sati and banya to see it as it is. How can you say that you're relinquishing samudaya? You have to apply sati and banya to separate the physical pain from the mental pain and study the true nature of pain. When pain appears, does it ever say, I'm painful? Does it know it's painful? No, it doesn't. It's just a phenomenon that appears and will eventually disappear. That's all there is to it. It doesn't say it's painful or explain why it appears and disappears. It's the jitta that says it's painful and as a result produces another layer of pain, namely mental pain. For this reason, the Lord Buddha had to teach you to study the nature of mental pain with banya. What causes mental pain to appear? 
It's Samudaya that's formed by the Jitta's unfounded opinion of the nature of pain. When the Jitta thinks that the physical pain is hurting it, it will also produce mental pain because it will want the physical pain to disappear. The more it wants the physical pain to disappear, the more will be the mental pain. The way to eliminate this mental pain is not to have any desire for the physical pain to disappear. No matter how intense the physical pain may be, you have to calmly and unflinchingly study the nature of this mental pain. When you have let go of your desire for the physical pain to disappear, the mental pain will disappear. Sometimes the physical pain will also disappear. If it doesn't disappear, like during illness, it won't disturb the jitta, because the jitta has eliminated its mistaken opinion of the physical pain. This is the way of understanding the nature of pain through the Four Noble Truths, and of realizing that it's the jitta's erroneous opinion of the nature of pain that's to blame. Who will have to bear the consequences of this mistaken opinion if not the jitta? And it's in the jitta where you'll have to study the Four Noble Truths. I have already told you that the components of Magga are Sati and Banya. It's only Magga that can remove Samudaya. As soon as Samudaya is eliminated, Dukkha will disappear. There is no need to talk about Nirodha, which is the disappearance of Dukkha, because Nirodha is the outcome of Magga. Nirodha will gradually appear as Magga gradually removes Samudaya. When Samudaya is completely eliminated, complete Nirodha will appear. This is the ultimate Nirodha, because Magga is now the ultimate Magga and Sadibanya the ultimate Sadibanya. Nirodha is now complete and perfect. The Four Noble Truths, Dukkha, Samudaya, Nirodha, and Magga, will each be undeniably true. When pain appears in your body, you'll accept that your body is the home of pain. If you can live in this body, why can't pain? But there will be no Dukkha and Samudaya in your Jitta, because they've been completely eliminated by Magga. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana, and about the Four Noble Truths. Do you have the Four Noble Truths? You're constantly being bombarded with Dukkha, both of the body and the Jitta. Why can't you see this Dukkha? You can't make stew out of Satipanya, but you can apply them in your contemplation. It's only Satipanya that can eliminate the Gilesas. You must always use Sati to supervise your practice. This is vital for your enlightenment. After your enlightenment, you'll never be shaken by anything. What you know, you will confidently tell others, like the Lord Buddha who, after his enlightenment, boldly propagated his complete and perfect Thamma teaching to the world, the Thamma that was previously unknown to others. He was a true sage who would fearlessly teach the timeless truth, the Thamma that's still alive and well today. If the Thamma isn't timeless, it would have disappeared a long time ago. What is this Thamma? It's the Four Noble Truths, Dukkha, Samudaya, Nirodha, and Magga. Dukkha disappears because Samudaya ceases. Samudaya is composed of craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, and craving for not becoming. Gama tanha, pava tanha, vi pava tanha. You have to relinquish your cravings with Magga. When you see that your cravings produce your Dukkha, you'll relinquish them. What is Magga? It is Sila, Samati, and Banya. Right views and right thoughts are the components of Banya. Right speech, a component of Sila, is to talk about getting rid of the Gilesas, Tanha, and Asava, not talking politics or mundane matters. There are ten topics that conform to right speech and are called Saleka Tamma, or effacing Tamma. They are the following Abhitta wanting little, Santosa, being contented with whatever is given, Asangsagakata, not socializing or interacting with others. Lilegata, delighting in seclusion. Viryarampa kata, practicing diligently. Sila, being morally and ethically pure. Samati, mental calm and stability. Banya, contemplating on the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering, and not self that will eventually lead to enlightenment. Vimutti, freedom from suffering. Vimutti jnana dasana, knowledge and vision of Vimutti. These are the ten topics of the Saleka Tamma. If you want to talk, you should talk about these topics because they're uplifting and entertaining. Right action is another component of Sila. Walking and sitting meditation to eliminate the Gilesas are right actions. There are other actions that seem to be right, like building temples, but if monks take them up, they can unknowingly promote the growth of the Gilesas and destroy the Tamma in their hearts, if they have any. If they don't have any Tamma, 
then these tasks will totally ravage their hearts and are not right actions for meditators. There are four kinds of right exertions. The exertion to prevent evil from arising. What is evil? It's the kilesa-driven actions that produce suffering. The exertion to eliminate evil that has already appeared. The exertion to do good and virtuous actions. The exertion to maintain and nurture good and virtuous actions that you already have. Right mindfulness is the establishment of mindfulness at the body, feelings, jitta, and tamma. Right samadhi is making the jitta calm and stable. Wrong samadhi is to have visions of heaven or hell and mistake them for the magga pala and nibbana. These are the components of magga, the weapon for the total destruction of the gilesas. It's normal for the jitta to accumulate the gilesas because it's still under the spell of the king of the gilesas, which is avidza that continually instigates sankara to think about the gilesas tanha and asava. Avidza will never let sankara think about tamma, only you can. In the beginning stages of practice, it's necessary to push sankara to think about tamma or magga. Sankara that thinks about Samudaya is for the amassing of the Gilesas. Sankara that thinks about Tamma and eliminates the Gilesas and Asava is Magga and is in your Jitta. So why don't you ever come up with any results from your practice? When are you going to get serious with your practice instead of being weak and lazy? How are you going to become enlightened if you're weak, lazy, foolish, and incompetent? Are these the qualities for attaining Magga, Pala, and Nibbana? If they are, all living beings would have already attained Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. There wouldn't be any need for them to strive with diligent effort, endurance, and perseverance. But in truth, your exertion is your only weapon that will destroy the Gilesas, Dharnha, and Asava and achieve the freedom from Dukkha. Therefore, you must really put in your effort. Don't be complacent. The practice community is getting smaller with every passing day. Don't blame me for not warning you. The number of enlightened teachers who truly know the way is steadily decreasing. Some day, you will be like a loose kite in the sky, with nothing to hold it from being blown away by the wind. You should now accumulate as much tamma as you can while you are still able to do so, because those who can truly teach tamma are nearly extinct, and you can actually count them. There are not many role model monks left for you to follow, and those that are left are getting older with each passing day. If you don't accumulate the tamma now when it's conducive and favorable, when will you do it? You're studying with your teacher now because you can't practice on your own. After you've learned how to practice, you should at least accomplish samadhi. Then you will have to investigate with banya, which is very extensive and profound. It's not possible to explain banya to make every listener understand at the same time but it's possible to explain to each individual practitioner who has specific questions arising from his investigation because there are specific issues to be resolved. It's rather difficult to explain manya in general terms.